Shalom. Welcome to the Messianic Hour with Rabbi Scott Sekulow. The Messianic Hour is a program designed to give you insight into the Jewish roots of your faith. Rabbi Scott is also here to answer your questions and help you gain a deeper understanding of Bible prophecy. And now, here's your host, Rabbi Scott Sekulow. Shalom and welcome to another edition of the Messianic Hour. I'm your host, Rabbi Scott. I'm here with my wife, Judy, and this show is dedicated to reaching the lost and educating the found. And we come from a very unique perspective. I was raised in a traditional Jewish household. My wife, Judy, was raised in a Baptist household, and God brought us together 24 years ago. And we have been worshiping the Lord together for about 20 of those years. I was not a believer for the first four years. And um, it is great to just be in one accord with that. And as we come together, we want to encourage you to take notes. We're going to be looking at the book of Exodus, the uh, dealing with the name of God. We're going to be talking about this first half. And then the second half of the show, we're actually going to be talking about why we don't use the unspoken name of God, the yad Hey vav Hey, the letters that spell out his name. So we're going to be looking at that as well. Judy, we also have a very big announcement for those who people who live in the Atlanta area, specifically the Gainesville, Buford, and Flowery Flower Branch Branch area, coming in the middle of next month, uh, September, right? September 20th, we'll have Taz Saeed speaking um, up there. He's the author of Once an Arafat Man, right? A former terrorist, sniper. Um, Driver for Yasser Arafat, I mean, pretty... Yeah, Muslim, and who now knows the Lord, and he'll be speaking up there. And then on um, the 27th, that following Friday, you're going to start teaching Messianic Foundations up there. That's right. Which should run through about November 15th, and then we'll be starting Friday night Shabbat services in the Gainesville Flowery Branch area. That's right. So if you live in that area, the Gainesville Flowery Branch Buford area, you've been looking for a place to worship... We're going to be starting Congregation Beth Adonai North on Friday night. You'll be able to come in there and um, be a part of it. And you can join us with this great opportunity to worship together. And we're very excited about it. Uh, For more information, you can go to our website. Actually, you can go to BethAdonai.com. That's B-E-T-H-A-D-O-N-A-I.com. It's also a link there on RabbiScott.com. And you can sign up for more information on it. It'll be a uh, eight, uh, ten-week class, free of charge. Uh, come and learn about the Jewish roots of your faith. And if you want, you can join us as we start a Messianic congregation. Up there. There's not been one up in that area, and it's been needed for a while. And the Lord's put it on our heart. So, Gainesville, Flowery Branch, watch out. Here comes the rabbi. <laughs> That's scary. That is scary. But we'll have a great time, a great opportunity. Visit our website, RabbiScott.com, for more information. Sign up for our newsletter. There you'll also get more information about that and our upcoming trip to Israel, June 9th through the 19th, 2014. And it'll be a great trip. We, we are almost out of our seats at the low price of this year's price of thirty nine ninety nine. So if you want to get in on that, go to our website, ask for more information. We'll be glad to send it to you. Again, when we get back, we'll be looking at the book of Exodus. Stay tuned. You're listening to the Messianic Hour. Welcome to the Messianic Hour. I'm Judy Seculo, and I'm glad that you're watching us and listening to us. And there's all these ways that you can interact interact with us on the various social media sites and various places that you can find the video of the radio show that's right we we kind of do both and we give you access to everything and you get to see the interaction with us which is a little amusing sometimes (laughs) so but anyway we are on exodus 1 1 through 6 1 we're looking to find messiah in the torah this one's rather involved i don't know if we'll make it through it all this time yeah we will yeah, that's what he says. So we will see. Do you want to get us started? Well, you know, it's interesting, Judy, because we talked about, you know, we're going into now where we see the name of God being revealed to, in the scripture. Mm-hmm. And it deals with the with how he says with the I am. And 
the you know y will some many times see it as y h y h or y h y w y h y h u h v v h v and v h and I'm saying it my mind is looking at one thing saying another and um this is the name that we don't speak of anymore because while it's not a commandment saying do not speak it it is in the sense that we're not to take the lord's name in vain and we know early on in uh early hebrew history that the name became so sacred that they only had the high priest say it once a year at the high holy days and the thing that we have to remember with this is that the hebrew language died out and then it was rebirthed now that's the other way how do you know you're actually pronouncing it correctly and we'll get into that well we'll and get also into that. in the torah there's no vowels so exactly all we have is letters so that. really what you see now is you see it called the lord right. if you read um jewish commentaries you see hashem hashem right. means the lord so and i know we're going to talk about using the sacred name on the second half right and and so people understand what the sacred name is because some people might n- have never understood what we're saying it's it's god's unspoken name which is yahweh we don't say it in uh in you know areas that could be used in the wrong way exactly so really he he became to he came to be known as the i am and the question is, how do we see Messiah in this Parsha? We've got to kind of compare this language of the the, re, the revelation to Moshe in Exodus 3.14 to the language that Yeshua used to describe himself, especially in the book of John. Right, because we know the story. Moses said, who do I tell him sent me? And his response is, tell him I am sent me. And, and- jo- Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. John is the only account of Yeshua's life which records the moments when he refers to himself as I am. So there's a direct correlation between the I am sayings and the I am revelation in Exodus chapter 3. And there's really kind of two lines of evidence for this. And the first one is the wording. Right. And that the wording is a linguistic one. And you know, the church fathers clearly indicate that at least Matthew's gospel was written in Hebrew and the others could have been written in Greek. But the thing that we have to remember is all of the first disciples, their their mother tongue, so to speak, was Hebrew. With the exception maybe of Luke, because he was most likely a Gentile who had converted. So he was most likely Greek, but uh, he, his knowledge was extremely well. And, of course, he was a doctor, so it's close enough. So the, the thing we have to remember, as we've talked about before, a lot of words in Hebrew doesn't necessarily translate directly or doesn't have a good translation, a good equivalent, right. when you put them in another language. And this is the case for the words, I am. Right. It could also mean, like, I myself. Mm-hmm. So we see that connection as well. And when you take it from Hebrew to Greek, it the word becomes ego emi, or I am. And in Greek, it's not always necessary to use the pronoun with the verb because the subjects include it within the verb. It's This is why I don't do well at other foreign languages besides English. Um, so the pronoun ergo is placed with the first person present tense form, I feel like I'm Natalie doing her daily grammar practice, um, of the to be verb. So it's really possible when Yeshua was saying, I am, he was saying ego in me. The ego was used for the the emphasis there. Well, that's what would have been translated. He most likely spoke Hebrew, too, because... Right. <laughs> well, we just said that, honey. So when he said, was saying, I am the light of the world, right. he was really saying, I myself and no other am the light of the world. Right. And, and, Judy, so it's important to understand that. And then the other part is the, really the reaction, how we see the language being used. And, again, you said, you know, while Greek was the main language, Hebrew was still spoken of primarily by the disciples and that and so uh we really even see in the scriptures where it talked about 
uh, this aspect, how it all comes together. Well, and if you take it in John eight forty eight through 59, that's John eight forty eight through 59, go read that and then pause if you're listening and then come back. Um, Yeshua is really kind of having this heated discussion with some of these Pharisees. Right. And the thing that they're discussing is whether or not a Jewish person can claim his physical ancestry to Abraham is sufficient enough to think that all is in order with his spiritual life. And Yeshua was kind of directing his reasoning to convince them that they needed to believe in him for spiritual life and not just rely on their lineage to Abraham. Just because I was born Jewish doesn't mean, you know, that that's it. I get a free ticket into heaven. Now, some people say, well, what about the scripture says in the end days, all of Israel will be saved. It's not a literally all of, it's a remnant of Israel who will be saved. Those Jewish people who believe Yeshua is Messiah. And at the end of this, uh, these verses, Yeshua basically says in so many words, you want to claim that Abraham is your father and therefore you rest in his merits. But I tell you the truth before Abraham was, I am. So Basically, he's saying, even though Abraham's great, I existed before Abraham. I'm greater than Abraham. And Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. So when Yeshua used that I am, he was using it as a reference to his eternal nature. And the thing that tells us this is look at the crowd's reaction to what he said. What did they do? They picked up stones to stone him. Right. Because they clearly understood what he meant by the I am. It was an unmistakable claim to the same nature of the I am of Moses and the burning bush. Right. And, you know, stoning was, you know. Because of blasphemy. They basically had his blasphemy. So that's. And then the other one we see the I am was in John 18, 1 through 11, when Judas was bringing the centurions to get Jesus for his crucifixion. And they ask him, he says, who are you looking for? And they say, Yeshua of Nazareth. And he says, I am. Well, what happens? Again, look at the reaction. What did they do? They drew back and they fell. Right. They were overcome with the power of his name. And, and so we see here clearly how this name and how it's representing to it. But again, how do we see that tie into the situation with Messiah in the scripture? And we clearly see this coming together and it really we need to focus really in on moses because moses has a situation where he almost dies Mm -hmm. and it says that god literally was going to kill him because he wasn't going to he didn't circumcise his, his son and so we see here again this connection of this pre incarnation of Messiah, the only face of God we can see and live is Messiah itself. And the verses that you're referencing is Exodus four twenty four through 26. Again, it's this very small reference, but it shows us that basically Moses encountered the Lord. Well, if he encountered the Lord, he encountered him in a fleshly form. And who? The only fleshly form we have is Yeshua. Pre-incarnate, we see it several times throughout. And is it such a hard thing for God, who created the world and did all this, to take on the form of a man to come and speak to us? Not at all. Very easy for him. We know he did it, and so we see that connection. And so it's so we see that Yeshua using the I am, and that can be totally equated with Moshe's I am. And we know that there's other appearances of Yeshua in the flesh right. during the time of the Abraham pat- and uh, Jacob mm-hmm. are both examples of the patriarchs. And so we've seen that Messiah revealed himself in two distinct ways through the language and through how he was encountered. And I think it shows that our forefathers who knew the Torah, knew much more about Messiah than sometimes we necessarily give them credit for. That's right. So I want to encourage you to go to our website, RabbiScott.com, for more information. You can sign up for our newsletter. With that, you get a free book, I Have a Friend Who's Jewish to You, and a prophecy card. 70 key prophecies, where they're found in the Torah, where they're fulfilled in the Renewed Covenant, and a great uh, witnessing tips on how to share with your unsaved Jewish and Gentile friends. Remember, we are a listener-supported show. You can support us right there at the website as well. We'll be back right after this break. We will run, we will run to the mountain of God. We will 
Welcome to the Messianic Hour. I'm Judy Seculo, and I'm glad that you're still with us as we just finished up Exodus 1. 1-1 one, one through, I think, 6-1. Sure. We'll be moving on to the next section in the next show coming up. But what we want to address on today is something that we talked about in the first half of the show, which is what should we call the Lord? What should we right. call Adonai? And, you know, there's many ways. To, he has all the Hebrew names. There's all these ways to address him. But it seems in this day and age, I'm probably going to step on a little bit of toes. So pull your toes in. Get your toes out of the way. There's this whole movement of... We've got to address God by his proper name. Right, or his uh, sacred name in that we, you, we're seeing this even in the church today as well. It's not just in some fringe groups of the Messianic movement. Uh, the church is starting to do that too, and it's really an area that we need to be very careful about because we see that even Yeshua didn't use his father's sacred name. And the reason why we don't use the sacred name is we don't want to take the Lord's name in vain. And think about it. How many times have you heard people, when they get mad, they'll say, GD, I don't even say the word because it's just so wrong, because you're using God, one of God's names in vain. And we're not supposed to be doing that. So we got to be very careful about that and how we handle it. And so people want to say, you know, there's some group called the sacred name, and they, they only want to use that name. And that's just, it's biblically, it's wrong. Now, are we can uh, is there a commandment that says no we sh- cannot say his name whatsoever no but we don't want to we don't want to do it by accident we don't want that unintentional sin to take place if you make his name common that's the issue Matter of fact that's really what it deals with with the scripture which says that thou shall not make his name you know you know keep it sacred some people think the opposite of sacred is unsacred and it's actually not it literally would mean to make it common or normal well and the thing that again i think we have to touch on is you know you you want your witness to be effective right. anybody wants to be able to to witness for the lord and to be effective and if you're you you never know who's listening to you we've had times where we're out at a restaurant having conversations and we can see the person next to us leaning closer and closer and closer listening to what we're saying and sometimes they've actually jumped in our conversation sometimes they've interrupted our conversation sometimes they just listen you and you never know who that person is or what their story is but you don't want to be offensive and if you go around throwing this name out and you've got an an unsaved jewish person there or any actually any jewish 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 person person. you're you've just been you've just created an offense i'll tell you right now when i get an email and i see his unspoken name in it click gone deleted don't they could be giving me a million dollars don't want it because it's it's uh, that offensive and that's what we have to be careful about Plus, we know from the scripture that, you know, Judy, if, if the president of the United States came up, we wouldn't say, hi, Obama, how you doing, right? Or, you know. Mr. O. <laughs> right. You know, we would we'd have to be, you, you're politi- you know, you, you give that respect. The, the respect and the honor. You know, my brother Jay would go to the White House uh, when President Bush was in office. And while he, President Bush, would have nicknames for the people who come in, he was Mr. President. You didn't, you know, he didn't get a nickname. Well, and I think when you start using a a a nickname for someone, it it you become familiar. Right. And that's not, uh, you know, we need to have a respect and awe relationship with with God, and and not one because you know kind of familiarity breeds contempt exactly um that saying goes so we have to i think we have to be careful and by using names that reflect that reverence that reflects that awe that doesn't bring him down to a peer level of us you're keeping the the proper boundaries within a relationship you know our daughter calls us mom and dad. She doesn't call us Scott and Judy. Right. I, you know, I don't call my mom her first name. In fact, I have a hard time calling people who are older than me. And now that I'm older, they're not that much older. But I have a problem even calling them by their first name right. sometimes. I'll throw in a miss or a mister, you know, right. just to make my own self feel comfortable. You know, it, it's really interesting to see how that connection is. And we had to take our cues from Yeshua. Remember, this tradition was established before Yeshua was on earth. We know that our Messiah had no problem correcting us. But yet, how does he refer to his father? How does he refer to God as father, as 
many different names, but never that spoken name. Matter of fact, it's clear from the scripture that Yeshua used the different names, you know, Adonai, others, to avoid pronouncing the name uh, as written. When Yeshua read from the scroll of Isaiah of Nazareth, his reading included the name of God. And so we even see that, that he didn't use it there. And so now it's interesting because some people will say, oh, but, you know, he, he was going to use the name of God. Let's look at his prayer. When the disciples asked him, how do we pray? They, he said, pray the, uh, to them in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. So he, again, doesn't use it there, but what is he basically saying? Make your name sanctified, special. Don't make it normal. Don't make it an everyday use. You know, I, growing up as a kid, and Judy, you knew this, is when we went to college together, and before I was a believer, if I stubbed my toe, the first word out of my mouth would be Jesus Christ, not praising him, but it was used as a cuss word. And, and so we have to understand where people are coming from. And if you're trying to witness, you brought this up before, if you're trying to witness to a Jewish person and you say the sacred name, forget it. The doors are closed because that is something that they just don't do. And Yeshua himself didn't do it. We see here it's very easy to understand it. Now, one of the questions people say, well, you know, it's written all throughout the Bible. That's right. It's written. We can read it. It's not a commandment against reading it. It's saying it. It's using it in the wrong way. Well, and when you when you use something over and over and over, it becomes common. And the whole thing is that if something becomes common, that's really kind of like you said, is the opposite of holy or right. set apart. You know, for example, vessels that were used in the temple and the tabernacle weren't used anywhere else. Exactly. They were to be for that time and so we have to remember that to keep his name holy don't use it in a common context you know if you just oh i have to use it use it at home in your prayer closet so nobody else can hear you but don't bring it out for common for for public consumption right. in common places now it can be used in you know using where you'll see it being used in a community area is maybe in a song but again it's a controlled area and and that's acceptable but still not exactly the the best thing to do but we do see that connection and how it comes together so we see yeshua never used that name well and that's the thing if we're disciples of yeshua that's who we're right. disciples of follow his example follow his biblical model and as you were saying right. when i jumped in and, here. And, and that's the important thing and so when you have these groups that are these you know oh but i need to you know speak the you know that sacred name so this will happen actually we need to go to the characteristics of his name if you need healing you want to call out to, to for the healing you know Jeho jehovah jireh those type things that is what we what we can call upon that name call upon the name of the lord is not the sacred name but the name in which the character of what you need from god so what you many times you'll see in the orthodox community they'll use the name hashem meaning basically the lord uh congregate beth adonai means house of the lord that it's a it's again a substitute or elohim these are other names that are used for that understanding and again it's it's really not it's it's keeping it's keeping the respect keeping the boundaries right. being um keeping a good witness and not creating offenses you know right. let the words in my mouth and the med meditations of my heart be acceptable to you O lord well again how do you how do you how are you acceptable stay within the boundaries exactly and for and those of you saying oh but i, I want to use the name or you know god gave me you know, i know his name you know what again you don't want to be an offense to someone and it's clear through the jewish community that is the uh something that is just not done and you don't want to be a fence, and you don't want to be a stumbling block, so that's how you stay away from that. I really want to encourage you again, go to our website, RabbiScott.com, for more information. You can sign up for our newsletter. You get that free gift. And remember our trip coming in June of 2014. The price is $39.99. You can get this year's pricing for next year, but we only have a few seats left at that price. So jump in. You want to be a part of that. Remember, you can also plant a tree in Israel, 
and help support this work as you support us online. Until next week, this is Rabbi Scott and Judy saying shalom and pray for the peace of Jerusalem.